everyone. Uh, I'm Charlotte Alter. I'm a senior correspondent at Time Magazine and also the author of The Ones We've Been Waiting For, How a New Generation of Leaders Will Transform America. Um, I'm so excited to talk about the unique challenges and opportunities facing Gen Z with our two fantastic guests today. Please join me, please join me in welcoming Secretary Miguel Cardona, U.S. Department of Education, and Will I Am, president and founder of the I Am Angel Foundation. Thank you both so much for being here today. Um, I want to start a little broad for a second. Um, Secretary Cardona, what do you think is unique about Gen Z, and what do you think educators and future employers need to understand about this generation? Thank you. First of all, I'm glad to be here uh, at CGI and just the amazing conversations that are happening. I'm glad to be here with uh, Will and um, just really taking advantage of the opportunity that we have. You know, um, Gen Z, what can I say? Look, I'm a father of a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old, so I have a little experience. And, and what I know is that I have so much confidence in that generation um, that we have to make sure we're evolving our systems to meet them where they are. They care about the environment. They care about mental health supports and making sure that it's accessible to more. They care about equality. Uh, again, I mean, we could learn from them so much. And I think as we're thinking about developing out our systems, including education, we gotta meet them where they are and listen and make sure they have a seat at the table. Uh, we have to do a little bit more listening uh, to Gen Z in my opinion. Will, uh, the I Am Angel Foundation works with low income, working class, and immigrant students from your hometown in East Los Angeles. And what I think is really interesting about the foundation is that you mostly focus on sort of project-based learning, like robotic club, robotics clubs, STEAM, uh, and sort of providing specific opportunities in this highly technical AI-enabled world that they're entering. So I'm wondering, why are project-based activities really reaching this generation? Why is that so important? Um, Hands-on, understanding you know, how they could contribute to the world by being taken serious to solve problems with advanced technologies. Um, not seeing someone use these advanced technologies, but um, really understanding how they work, um, being pushed to utilize their imagination, their dedication and commitment in collaboration um, to solve these problems. Um, having mentors come from world leading um, companies like Boeing and um, NASA coming to mentor and support these kids, treating education as competition um, uh, and really seeing how they can excel uh, with this framework called cooperation, where you cooperate and compete at the same time. So project-based learning is, is really what the world is truly about. You have, a, you have something that you're interested in, there's a project, you learn about it, and your passion and imagination will thrive. Um, everything else just seems a bit like hocus pocus, uh, the ones that really thrive. Uh, there's people that run awesome, huge companies that never really went to traditional college, their project and their passion was the thing that they were into, and they changed the world doing that. You, and you find that out later. Um, by doing that for a kid uh, as they're developing to go out into the world and tackle problems and being taken serious, um, I've seen how, how transformative it was for my community when we started that in 2008. So Secretary, uh, the Department of Education recently launched the Career Z Challenge, which is looking at some of these same questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this? And what are sort of the specific skills that Gen Z needs? And how are those skills different than what millennials or Gen X or boomers needed to, to get jobs? Sure, let me contextualize that in a, in a, by saying that, you know, if we go back to the school systems that we had in 2019 before the pandemic, we're failing our kids. We have to evolve our schools to meet the opportunities that exist today. And there are over a million careers just with like the Chips and Science Act, the infrastructure, the climate provisions under the Inflation Reduction Act, that if our schools don't evolve, 
to help prepare our students with those programs like the one that uh, was mentioned here, giving students hands-on learning opportunities that are preparing them and giving them skills for those careers, then we're failing our kids. So uh, this, gen uh, this challenge uh, uh, is giving $2.5 million to start up uh, innovation in education, mm. where we have uh, high schools, colleges, talking to industry partners saying, you know, what do you need? you need? You need coders, and how can I build up those skills in my high schools, in my two-year colleges, so that these students walk out of high school and maybe a two-year school with opportunities, choices, and a career that can really uplift them and their families. So, Will, you've had such a unique educational journey, and Secretary, I want to ask you about yours in a second as well. Um, but your journey took you both through the music world and the tech world, and you spent part of your childhood being bused across town to attend better performing schools, and you're now getting your MBA at Harvard. Um, how did all of... How did all of these experiences prepare you for your career, and how do you think Gen Z and sort of rising, uh, rising leaders should balance these kind of traditional and non-traditional educational paths? Um, I, I would say that, you know, my career is purpose. Um, just my hobby is music. And I made money um, and being able to take care of my family because I really gave my all to my hobby my passion. But my purpose, even before we were, I, I, ha I had success, my family, um, that's what we do in the neighborhood. My mom was the after school teacher. My uncle was the basketball coach to keep the kids off the street. My aunt is dispatch at the uh, police station at Hollenbach, right across the street from the headquarters of our foundation. My aunt works at the homeless shelter. My grandmother worked at City of Hope. So purpose is what my family has always done. Um, um, and music was just a vehicle to take me around the world just to see how the world works. And I was able to meet amazing people like Dean Kamen, um, American inventor, uh, my mentor, amazing superhero doing amazing things. Um, and the, th the things that I do in my community is by way of meeting these awesome superheroes and bringing these programs to kids so they don't have to leave their neighborhood to go to school. Like every kid in every hood says, I can't wait to get out of here. Instead of, I can't wait to change my community. Right, gentrification is going to happen anyhow. It's called Brooklyn, right? <laughs> but it doesn't have to look like that. It could just look like we transform our neighborhoods ourselves, right? Raise the value of our communities ourselves being able to afford as we raise the value of our communities ourselves, have kids that go out there and you know equip themselves with tomorrow's skill sets today so they could go out and solve problems, work at awesome companies, or start industries themselves. Um, and in this crossroad, this new renaissance, there's, a, there's one way um, to solve that fast. Like, so if you were to say, hey, what's your foundation about? Yeah, we bring STEM skill sets to the inner city. Um, there's programs that we adopt, like FIRST. Is that something that I should do, or am I just filling a void on something that should have been done? Right, so, uh, and take this program called FIRST and put it in every single school across America, because we're just now seeing, for the first time post-COVID, this new thing that has entered society. Generative AI, to understand that, that, that complex uh, of a system, competing in robotics, you're gonna understand these systems. And it's a quick fix. Put first in every single elementary with uh, uh, First Lego League, every junior high school, every high school, these kids are gonna go out into the world with the skill sets of tomorrow because it's inevitable. That is the configuration of tomorrow. Gen Z, why is it so important to get them to pre prepared? Because a machine should not be, a human should be able to compete with the machine and understand the machine. Our, my generation didn't have to worry about a calculator doing calculations on its own. <laughs> Our generation just played video games. These games that, that these kids are gonna be playing We've seen chess 
beat chess masters. The, the, the technology that's right around the corner in our lives now, it should not be the case. It's a humanity, it's a, it's a, a human right to be able to prepare the youth for this technological tomorrow. What's a quick fix? First in every school. Secretary Cardona, um, I'm actually really curious to hear your thoughts on what Will just said about how AI is gonna change the workforce and how to prepare students for that. Absolutely, look, it's an opportunity. I look at it as an opportunity. You know, a lot of people talk about the, co the, the risks. Yes, there are risks, we have to have guardrails, but this is an opportunity that we have that we must embrace. The next generation is ready to embrace it. We have to make sure that we're designed to provide the STEM uh, fields early in elementary school, middle school, high school, and we have to be intentional about making sure we have girls in our STEM field. Uh, we would miss an opportunity if we didn't do a better job getting girls in our STEM field and underrepresented groups in our STEM fields because we know careers of t today and tomorrow will require STEM. Uh, we have to get it in our classrooms earlier, and we have to be intentional about making sure girls see themselves as STEM students as well. Can I add to that? Of course. All right, so we all know the schools in our neighborhood, and every single high school has a football field. And I don't care how much you want to look at um, equality, inclusion, still right now, your niece is not going to play for the Raiders. She's not going to play for the Patriots. She's not going to be quarterback anytime soon. <clears throat> That's unfortunate. It's just the way the world is. But how is it that we can tolerate, which is great, my uncle played football for the Falcons. I wanted to be a football player growing up until I got a concussion. Um, how can we have a football field in every single high school when one company benefits from that skill set, the NFL, and one gender excels? And we cannot have a robotics program in every single high school where everyone benefits from. Why is it that when a kid graduates to go to college and they focused on football, there is a TV show about it called The Draft. And when they graduate college to then go play professional, there's another draft. And you identify who that person is and what company in the NFL drafts them to play for them. But when somebody graduates from Dartmouth or Brown or Stanford or MIT, no one knows when they go work at Google or Facebook. When somebody graduates from high school to go to Stanford or Brown, there's no draft to let you know what school they're going to for that profession, and you know they're gonna be solving problems. Why is it that we don't celebrate problem solvers, but celebrate problem makers? If I, <laughs> there's algorithms that amplify and promote the most hideous things that humans do for humans, the algorithm is making sure that we are promoting distortion, distraction, all kinds of wacko stuff. But as a community, as a village, we have to focus, laser focus, on the things that we want to be, an, uh, to build an awesome tomorrow. Inclusion, diversity are great starts. But words, actions are more important and putting robot, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen it, I've seen going to my neighborhood before we had robotics. I've seen what happened afterwards. I remember doing this, pro, this thing called Yes We Can for Obama. He did that speech in New Hampshire. Now New Hampshire is like the booming region for synthetic biology, for robotics, for engineering, and just to, make, to ensure that New Hampshire stays booming and zooming, Every single school is gonna have first in it. Dean just told me that just today. Now how do we get that across every single state around America? We also know that semiconductors, we have a shortage of that. We don't even have the skill sets to make our own semiconductors. We all know the, our, our reliance upon these technologies and sending them offshore to be able to make them. America needs to lead there. How are we gonna do that if we're not educating our, 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 our our kids to be able to go down that field, which is the most important um, um, field in the world. And to do that fast, having a 30-year plan, first in every school, you have to start there. So I, I want to ask- I love this. He's like a spokesman for a raise the bar, lead the world strategy, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> Look, we are revolutionizing career pathways, which is an investment in every school. 
Um, look at the work we're doing to try to lift this up. We recognize millions of jobs are coming. And if we do, like I said at the beginning, if our schools look like they did before the pandemic, we're failing our kids. So we have to create those pathways early and make sure that STEM is part of schools, every elementary school, middle school, and that there are pathways to these careers. Just before this meeting, I was at a meeting with uh, the CEO of Google. And we were seeking commitments to make sure that they're tapping into our two-year colleges, our high schools, to give pathways, internships to students. Uh, this is a revolution because there's opportunities that didn't exist five years ago. And I love the private-public partnerships because that's what we need. We need to, all of us, wrap our arms around our students and give them opportunities. So I, I have a question for, for both of you because we've talked a lot about the opportunities that are available to Gen Z, but there also are still some significant obstacles. And just in the last year, the Supreme Court struck down uh, the Biden administration's student debt forgiveness plan, and they also struck down affirmative action. Uh, and you cannot talk about educational opportunities for Gen Z w without talking about affordability and equity. So, uh, Secretary, what is the administration's plan to address affordability and equity uh, in the aftermath of these setbacks? And will I also want to hear from you on this. So look, I think the Supreme Court got it wrong on affirmative action and the Supreme Court decision to block uh, student debt relief, targeted student debt relief, which would have addressed some of the uh, wage inequities in our country as well, the, the wealth inequity. Um, but we're not stopping. With regards to affirmative action, we know colleges are better when they're made up of diverse learners. We know our country is better when we could tap on the shoulder of any kid, regardless of race and place, and give them a pathway forward. So. I think next week we're going to be releasing a report of what we heard from college presidents, what we heard from our students um, regarding what ways, what steps we could take to diversify our student body. To me, they might have taken a tool away, but they didn't take our intent to ensure all students in this country have access. And as far as college debt, look, we have a system of have and have nots. And for far too long, we've normalized the fact that people uh, are saying no to college early on because they're afraid of the debt. I'm a first-gen college student myself, and it was, it was a little scary going to college and thinking how much debt I would be in. We have to fix that. And we're unapologetic about the $117 billion in debt relief we provided to over 3.4 million Americans. We're unapologetic about the SAFE plan, income-driven repayment plan, where you're only going to be asked to pay what you can afford. We're unapologetic about providing uh, public servants loan forgiveness after 10 years of service uh, to their country or to their community. Like Higher education needs to be more accessible. And we're making sure that two-year colleges are also an option. This four-year college or bust mentality in this country is setting us back. We need to make sure we're giving students options. They could go to a two-year school and go into the workforce, or they could go to a two-year school, four-year school. We're creating options at an affordable rate. We're proud of the work we're doing there. Will, what do you think? I'll use um, entertainment as a lens to enter, um, and then uh, spread that vision across um, America and job creation. So Hollywood decided to go on a strike uh, because of the inhumane uh, business practice on how to treat people's essence and likeness when engaging with AI. Um, AI didn't do that. AI didn't say, hey, listen, y'all gonna come up in here, I'm gonna take your image, and forever uh, you ain't never gonna get paid. AI didn't do that. Humans did that. Greed did that. So if that's how humans are treating this new crossroad, this new renaissance, where they decide to go on a strike when AI can write, maybe that's the wrong time to strike. Maybe that's the wrong time to be greedy. That's the wrong time to undermine people's value. And it's a lesson to be, that we need to learn how humans treat humans. We are in a time where logic machines can outlogic us. Maybe we need to be more human and have more empathy because a machine's not gonna outlove us. And if we are practicing greed, then we are creating a bias for machines to do that. And then that's what, really, what we're really afraid of, is when a machine mimics our greed and our inhumane ways to each other. 
So here we are. Now take that same lens for an entertainment, and we know it's wrong, as we are here now. Affirmative action and college debt. Well, everyone's gonna have the best professor in their pocket. A Yale professor, MIT professor, Harvard professor in their pocket. So what is the price of education when I can just come here and say, um, I want to learn about um, quantum entanglement, but can you do it from the form of a, um, a NWA rap style when it comes to selling <laughs> sneakers for me to understand quantum entanglement? <laughs> now you're really testing me. You're asking me to explain quantum entanglement, but in the form of a rap song by NWA, Niggas With Attitudes. That's quite the tall order. But let's see what I can come up with. Just don't judge me too harshly. Here goes. I'm going to drop some knowledge. Using quantum mechanics as the subject. Wow. We're going to start with entanglement, a phenomenon that makes you say, what the? Yes, wow. but do it from the perspective of selling sneakers, please. I feel like we could do this all day. <laughs> oh, now you want me to incorporate sneaker selling into my quantum rap. Challenge accepted. Here goes. I'm slinging kicks. You know I'm the best. But there's something about my game that's really a test. It's quantum entanglement, and it's quite complex. But I'll break it down for you so it's not a wreck. I sell these sneakers, Uncanny. and they're always a hit. But I'm going to tell you how it works with a bit of wit. Wow. You ready? Well, thank you so yes, much. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, I'm going to use some quantum lingo. So you might get lost, but don't be a slow poke. Anyways. <laughs> are entangled, which means their state wow, can't be disentangled. Go. It's weird, but it's true. It's something called spooky action at a distance. It's no ruse. Two particles can be linked. Pretty uncanny that the, that the Anyways, AI my, can my do point, that. My, my point wow. of what I'm saying is, you go, to a, you go to a college and you tell the professor, I don't understand that. Speak it to me so I can understand. We are going to enter forever learning where educational systems will understand my limitations or a person's like focus issues, um, and the concept of ADHD is no longer. The concept of m giving somebody medicine to be sheep herded so they could understand the way everyone understands. Maybe that was never the path for us. So how do we move forward? At the time that we need to be amplifying and progressing so that America remains leaders in society, we need to, one, have empathy. Two, we need to prepare with urgency. Four, three and four, we need to embrace new technologies so that we address job displacement that you know is right around the corner. Right? We know that white collar jobs are, are going to be threatened because of these technologies. We know that blue collar jobs are going to be threatened because of these technologies. We also know that new industries are going to come. And who are the people that are going to erect these new industries? Is it going to be the underserved that is a result of humanity's errors to be underdevelopers and underservers, but we never point to see who are the developers and servers in the first place? We just say underdeveloped and underserved. That's actually people and policies that are responsible for that, but never held accountable. Now we have these new technologies that are going to help people solve the problems themselves. So why should America be going that path where we're discounting the, 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 the pains that students have suffered due to like, yo, I want to go to college to get a job. Now they got a diploma in debt right. with no job to fill. And guess yeah. what? Shit tons of jobs are going to be uh, rendered obsolete in the next hot second. And so that means by 2030, we're going to all be scratching ahead. How do we get here? And we're gonna, we, we would have realized that we got here because we weren't thinking straight. Um, and then Gen Z, you're going to have to solve these issues that we are ignoring because we are uh, don't have no empathy wow. and we're not leading with humanity. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, let's, give, let's give one more round of applause to our panel. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being here with us today.